welcome to the Cause Seminary. Uh, so glad that you're with us for this session. And in this session, we're going to look at some of the doctrines of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to talk about pneumatology. So let's jump in. And as we've covered in other sessions, our God is triune, one in three and three in one. Within the Godhead, it's the Holy Spirit who is the active agent of God's dealings with creation in the earth. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. Without the ongoing activity of the Holy Spirit, knowledge of God in the earth would be impossible. The Holy Spirit, of course, is God, and God is the Holy Spirit. And just as a personal note, I love the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit's role in my everyday life. And uh, I, I don't know what I would do without the Holy Spirit. So we're going to cover the nature of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, or, or you could say primary vocation. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and just touch on spiritual gifts. Uh, we can't come anywhere close to giving all, you know, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit like an exhaustive treatment. Uh, there is, of course, lots of great resources. Uh, there's also some very poor resources, so just be careful uh, what you get into, uh, mostly stick to the Bible would be my recommendation, and um, then go from there. So there are quite a few names given to the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. Among those would be the Spirit of Yahweh. Uh, this is where you'll usually find it translated as the Spirit of the Lord. This is to say, He who creates or brings into being. In John 14 um, through 16, Jesus says, I'll send another comforter a helper, a counselor. The Holy Spirit is also called the spirit of truth, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of life, the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit of promise, the eternal spirit, spirit of grace, spirit of glory. And then along with all these helpful names, because remember, God doesn't do names like we do in the modern sense, where, okay, that sounds nice, pick it out of a baby book. But each name of God or, or name of the Holy Spirit indicates an aspect of who God is. So along with those names, of course, indicating this is, this is part of the role of the Holy Spirit, there are many symbols of the Holy Spirit given throughout Scripture. Symbols give us this sort of concrete image of the, uh, 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 you know, the abstract or the ethereal or, or the sometimes unexplainable. And so God will give us these symbols to help us grow in understanding, to say, well, it's like this or, or the Holy Spirit is like that. And, and so these symbols stand for realities that are intangible, yet very real. So let's talk about some of these symbols of the Holy Spirit. This is going to include wind. Uh, the, the Hebrew word ruach uh, has, it has this wide range in the semantic language. It, it could mean breath or spirit or wind. It's used together with another uh, word, nefesh, and, and, and the basic meaning of nefesh is, is living being, or, or to say anything that has breath, so alive with breath, or, or living breath. This is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit. So for example, in Ezekiel 37, we find ruach translated as breath. Yahweh will put his spirit, his breath, on Israel. God will breathe on Israel. Uh, the Greek word, so New Testament, uh, mainly uses pneuma, and it's nearly identical to ruach, the, the symbol of wind. It carries this invisible nature of the Holy Spirit. We, we, can, we can see and feel the effects of the wind, but the wind itself is unseen. So it is with the Holy Spirit. We can, we can see and we can feel and we can experience the effects of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is invisible. Uh, Acts 2.2 uses the image of wind to, to forcefully describe the coming of the Holy Spirit, the, the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Like a mighty rushing wind, the Spirit of God came. Uh, another symbol would be water. And water, just like breath, uh, watch me, is necessary to sustain life. You need, you need breath, you need water. And, and Jesus, Jesus promises streams of living water said, from your belly will flow streams of living water. Not dead water, not still water, stale, but living water. Living is another way to say it's moving, it's flowing, fresh water. Uh, the person who delights in the, the law of Yahweh, the Bible says, and meditates on it day and night is like a tree planted by the streams of water, whose leaf does not wither. That's what the psalmist said. So the spirit of truth streams from the word as living water, 
that sustains, refreshes, empowers the believer, washes the believer. So another symbol of the Holy Spirit is fire. Fire, of course, has a purifying aspect. This is also seen in Acts 2. Uh, Coal is taken from the altar and, and purifies the prophet Isaiah's lips. John the Baptist came along uh, to announce you know, the arrival of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, and said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So this is the separation of God's people from those who have rejected God and his Messiah, rejected Jesus, and, and who will suffer the fire of judgment. However... The purifying, fervent fire of the, the spirit of holiness is at work also in the believer. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Another symbol is oil. Uh, Peter said in Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. There's an, the oil of anointing. Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 and says, The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Uh, oil was used early on to anoint priests of Yahweh, priests of God, and, and then later on kings and prophets. And oil is a symbol of God's consecrating the believer, consecrating a person for an assignment, for the work of ministry, um, the Spirit of God coming upon someone, resting upon someone, and, and calling them into Christ. Another symbol is the dove. The Holy Spirit, it, it says, the Bible says, descended on Jesus like a dove, in the form of a dove. And, and this is in all four gospel accounts. The dove is a type of gentleness and peace. And it's notable to say that a dove is easily started, uh, startled. Uh, as soon as a dove would, would fly in, you know, it'll fly out. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, along these lines, um, uh, can, the Bible says, can be grieved. Uh, the Holy Spirit can be quenched. Or, of course, you know, on the other side, the Holy Spirit can be welcomed. And, and the Holy Spirit can be cherished and, and, and called upon, so like a dove, meaning the Holy Spirit, indwe- this is important, indwells us, but does not possess us. In fact, another verse says the Spirit is subject to the prophets, meaning just like a dove, when welcomed, when, when treated properly, can, can, you know, the dove will stay, but can be startled. Um, People will pray for the gift of a prayer language, for example, and, and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to sort of take over and, and almost like possess them and, and grab their tongue or their mouth. And, and, and it's just not biblically accurate. The, the Holy Spirit's like a dove, and, and it's, it's more of a partnership. And, and Paul said, I pray in the Spirit. So it's me praying, but it's the Spirit praying through me. It's, it's, it's I'm praying, but it's in the Spirit. It's like a dove. Um, he, he binds us to himself in love, in contrast to, you know, sin and, and demonic forces chaining us and, and forcing us. A dove is gentle, provides peace through the storms, uh, and, and even in dealing with people that are stuck in sin, it is gentle and, and gently draws them to the Lord and, and gently into repentance. And like an example, Ezekiel eighteen thirty, you see the gentleness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says, repent, turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all these offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. So this is the gentleness of the spirit of God. Uh, Okay, so now um, let's talk a little bit about the work of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? God's desire is to uh, know people and for people to know God. This This is clear Throughout all of scripture. This is the testimony of the entire Bible. Now the Hebrew word for know, to know, is yada. And, and this word often means to know by experience as opposed to know facts or to know history or to know a lesson. And of course there are many uh, believers that maybe know a lot about God. But the Holy Spirit's role is, is to help us know God. Um, same way that you might know facts about a celebrity, but you don't know the celebrity. It's possible to know about God, but to not really know God. And the Holy Spirit comes and draws us close to the Lord. Uh, so this is making Yahweh God uh, known by personal experience. That's the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of Old Testament people, New Testament people, 
The Holy Spirit changes people's hearts and makes them different people. The Holy Spirit's work is to be a comforter. John 14, 16, John 15, 26. He's the spirit of truth indwelling us. One who reminds us of all that Christ said. One who bears witness to Christ. And then one who will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's John 16, 8. So, so what does all that mean for us? The Holy Spirit in us goes to work cleaning up the untidy and the incomplete and the erroneous beliefs that we have concerning God and his work and his purposes and his word and, and what God's doing in the world. And, and we'll get a little bit more into that, but the Holy Spirit is busy cleaning us up and changing us into a new person. As Paul said, it, it, it's a lifelong work that'll never be completed on this side of the veil. So, so it's, a, it's a work to be understood as, as one of progress and not perfection. Um, the Holy Spirit comes to complete the work that is initiated at salvation. So, so it, here's an important distinction that, that the world is very confused about right now, and, and I would say even much of the church is confused about right now. You see people um, sort of getting in that tone of deconstructing or whatever they might call it. Here's something people are confused about. Jesus came to save us from our sin. Jesus did not come to save us in our sin. And the Holy Spirit makes the difference. Jesus didn't just come to save us from hell in the next life, but also from the hell on earth that we can sometimes experience that's created by our own sin. So the Holy Spirit comes and cleanses and changes, and, and we're going to get more into this, but sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit is also a teacher, helps the believer properly interpret and understand and apply the scripture, the promises of God, the word of God. Um, why would you ever want to read a book that was written by the Holy Spirit without the Holy Spirit's help? The Bible is a book that you can open and read, and, and it's like the author is right there to help you understand the exact intent, and, and, and here's what I meant by that, and here's how you can apply it for your life. Um, the Holy Spirit also is not just a teacher of the believer, but also of the unbeliever. Uh, the Spirit, it, the Bible says, convicts the world of guilt. This is in regard to sin and, and righteousness and judgment. Um, so... So the Holy Spirit is drawing all people into salvation. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And John 6, says, no one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So it's the Holy Spirit drawing every human being on the planet to God. Although some refuse that drawing, uh, and, and you know, some will say yes to that drawing, the Holy Spirit is drawing all people. Uh, the activity of the Holy Spirit continues in bearing witness to Christ. So you find this Old Testament, New Testament, as well as, of course, right now today. The Holy Spirit inspired the prophets as they wrote about the coming Messiah through John the Baptist. Luke says the Holy Spirit bore witness to the soon coming Christ. And now here's an especially important role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit as promise, as promise. This is what one theologian called a core function of the Holy Spirit, which is as a deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance in Christ. Check this out, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. What is it that the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church guarantees? Okay, here's another portion of scripture. Check this out. 2 Corinthians 5, and jump in at verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. An eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 
So here's what happens. Through the Holy Spirit, we come to know God by experience. This is the Hebrew, the yada. We, we experience the presence, the tangible touch of God, and our experience of the Holy Spirit is proof to us of the actual resurrection of Christ Jesus for us. This is what that guarantee means. It's like a deposit. It's an experience that, that teaches our hearts and, and, and helps us to know that Jesus died for us and rose for us. So an intellectual knowledge of the contents of the Bible is not knowing God. There are theologians. There are commentators on the Bible. There are professors with more degrees than a thermometer that know much more about the Bible, the history of the church and, and religion than any of us, maybe all of us combined, and, and yet they don't know God as in the yada sense. And, and Jesus said to those, I'll say, depart from me, you never knew me. You, yada, you never knew the Lord. And, and so the Holy Spirit not only verifies the resurrection, but also by an extension um, verifies the promises of God, all the promises of God, all the scripture. Something happens in your life, in your spirit, in your heart. When you've experienced the Holy Spirit, the promises of God, the scripture, becomes real to you. You can believe on the scriptures in a whole new way. So, all right, let's talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit and sanctification. The title Holy Spirit appears 94 times in the New Testament. God has many unique attributes, and, and any one of them, you know, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, all of that grace could have been used to identify the Spirit as well as holiness. But the writers of the New Testament use the phrase Holy Spirit so often because they recognize the Spirit's significance for the sanctification of God's people, leading us, empowering us, bringing us into holiness. So the cleansing rituals of the Old Testament, we're talking blood, water, fire you know um it's all pointing of course in, in symbolic shadow type ways to the ministry of jesus and then also to the holy spirit so the the spirit it, it, you know like we said is symbolized by water to be poured out like like a fluid like water and then also like fire and, and so we see all these cleansing rituals of the you know that the old testament you know the people of israel would go through in order to approach god and now we see all of the reality of that in the cross and then in the Holy Spirit. Um, th these are powerful symbols in the ancient Jewish mind, you know, for purification and sanctification. And I think some of our, our misunderstandings about the role of the Holy Spirit probably has to do with, we just don't know much about, um, you know, the, these ceremonial washings and, and, and some of this. And so a, a good question to consider at this point is what is sanctification? What does that mean? We, we have some idea. We've, we've heard sermons. We've heard phrases. Um, here's a simple definition. It's the process by which God is cleaning our world and its people. So God's ultimate goal is that everything, I mean everything, an, you know, animate and inanimate, will be cleansed from all sin and any, anything unclean. So to this end, God has provided the means of salvation through, of course, through Jesus. And at the end of time, he'll also, you know, it, God intends to give, give to the fire everything that cannot or will not be cleansed. That's Revelation 20, verse 11. So the task of the Holy Spirit, the role, the job of the Holy Spirit at this present stage in history, uh, you know, of salvation can be seen as, as fourfold. Let me break it down um, real quickly. One is to convict the world and then to cleanse the believer through the blood of Christ you know, at the new birth, to make real in the believer's life the legal pronouncement of righteousness that God has made. So it becomes real. And finally, to empower the believer to assist in the sanctification process of others by preaching the gospel, by serving them, by praying for them, by ministering to them, by building up the believer. And so what happens is, is as the Holy Spirit comes into our life and cleanses us and sanctifies us, then we get to participate in the process of helping others discover holiness for their own life. The Westminster Catechism defines sanctification as the work of God's free grace, where, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God 
and are enabled more and more to die into sin and to live unto righteousness. Uh, a great theologian, uh, Millard Erickson, defined uh, the term as well. And this is a very helpful uh, definition. Uh, Erickson said, It is the continuation of what was began at regeneration, when a newness of life was conferred upon and instilled within the believer. In particular, sanctification is the Holy Spirit's applying to the life of the believer the work done by Jesus Christ. So this definition includes all four aspects that we just mentioned, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So quick look at the New Testament church. Problems developed right away when some of these brand new believers um, use their freedom uh, from the Jewish legal code as an, sort of like an excuse, I'm going to live however I want to live. Sort of like, well, now I've got liberty in Christ. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And so some people were arguing, okay, the solution was, was both Jewish and Gentile believers. They need to obey the Mosaic law. They're going through all this in Acts 15. But this, at the same time, threatened you know, to diminish the, the power and the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus, that we're, we're truly free now uh, from the law. We've got this, this, this new covenant, this better covenant. So the problem was sort of there. It remained, how does one walk in a holy life in a fallen world. Um, how, so how do we treat, like, like biblically, theologically, in a, in a sort of comprehensive way, how do we deal with somebody's sin after baptism? This was a real issue for the church. It was like, well, you've been baptized. Why are you still struggling with sin? And so they were sort of figuring this out theologically. So for some time in the Middle Ages, uh, people like Augustine, Aquinas, I mean, the, like theological giants, there was this belief that when someone sinned, it could almost be offset you know, by the sacraments of the church, made up for in a way. And then the, the reformers came along, and they said, no way, this isn't biblical, this isn't cohesive with, with the doctrine of Scripture. They said, sanctification is a work of the Spirit through the Word. Yes, it, it can include the sacraments, but it's a work of the Holy Spirit in an individual's life. And, and then John Wesley came along and said, said, those without spiritual vitality had been saved but not sanctified. And this is an important doctrine for the church. Uh, he, he believed that justification and sanctification were two separate works of grace. Salvation was the first, and then sanctification was the next, was the second. And, and so he would often call the, the later work, the latter work of sanctification, Christian perfection. Um, and, and, you know, saying that it, it precluded any voluntary transgression of the laws of God. He, he was willing to say that sometimes involuntarily people will still sin, but John Wesley was strong on this. He said, hey, no, there's this second work. And once that happens, you, you are not going to willfully sin ever again. And so then more people came along and, and, and sort of added to the understanding that we now have as a church. Um, Reuben Torrey was an important church leader when it came to all this and, and offered a, a different slant. He taught that sanctification, this is important, was a process. But that power for service came from the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So sort of separated these out a little bit more. Um, so he rejected this idea that holiness um, was this second kind of immediate instant work of the Holy Spirit, and it was more of a, a process, and, and, and it was across um, you know, a lifetime. And, and so all of this um, was leading up to uh, what would happen in, in the late 19th century, and it was paving the way for sweeping revival called Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism. So... Many Pentecostals have seen three distinct works of the Holy Spirit. Salvation, sanctification as this ongoing process, and then the baptism in the Holy Spirit as like an empowerment for service um, in God's church and, and for the Lord. So as far as getting some terminology, uh, Kadesh, Hebrew for be holy, uh, carries the basic idea of, of separation or withdraw from ordinary use in order to be dedicated to God for special use. And it's found in the Bible as both a verb, to be set apart, as an a and also as an adjective, to, to be sacred. Um, the New Testament typically uses the Greek hagiazo, hagiazo to communicate the same exact idea. Um, but, but maybe the best way to define holiness is in terms of what, what God said, be holy, for I am holy. 
So, so holiness is, is something that, that's it's not human, it's not earthly in and of itself, it, it's, it's in another realm, it's, it's of God's realm, it's of God, I am holy. So God is, is calling us to separate ourselves and to be devoted unto him, holiness. And then finally, when it comes to sanctification, holiness, purification, a, as a work of the Spirit, the Hebrew prophets looked forward to a time when God would cleanse all humankind and the world to, you know, in which they lived. And God revealed to them that he would accomplish this great work of cleansing by his spirit. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Um, Ezekiel prophesied it like this. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I will save you from all your uncleanness. So God also promised that he will restore both Israel and Judah to the land and make them clean. That's Ezekiel 37, 21. So this is part of the sanctifying process of the world. So ultimately, the sanctification of the world takes place on an individual level. Each person has to choose whether to accept God's rule and, and, and God's reign or reject it. This is important. Those, those people who have chosen not to give up their sin will be cleansed by fire. So there's a sanctification process that happens in the life of the believer that, that requires cooperation. But there will be another sancti sanctification process that will happen in the lives of people that rejected Jesus that will not require participation It'll be painful, destructive, and it will be eternally lasting. This is the eternal punishment the Bible calls hell, the lake of fire, or the second death. Of course, Christians who choose to be sanctified by the Spirit, uh, this, this does require cooperation, and, and this is much more like the washing of water, the process removing sin, but saving the person. So, four distinct stages of the Spirit sanctifying, and, and then I'll move on and uh, share a bit more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, four, four stages, convicting the world. The first stage of sanctification and the greatest work of the Holy Spirit is bringing people into covenant relationship with God. The Spirit has three tasks among those who are unconverted, those who do not yet know the Lord. Conviction of sin, testimony about Christ, and confirmation of the word of God. And this is actually the greatest or, or the widest task of the Holy Spirit because it occurs among the largest group of people in the world, virtually everyone on earth who does not know the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is busy convicting the world. He has a ministry among the unconverted. And, and it's one of conviction, conviction of sin and, and unbelief and, and that righteousness is possible and desirable and that they can know the Lord and, and that Jesus as a Savior is a reality. This is all part of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth. So anytime you know, we have the privilege of leading someone to the Lord, the Holy Spirit has already been busy at work in that person's life for some time, convicting them, leading them. Next, the Holy Spirit, like we said, is cleansing the believer. So, so the Spirit's work at salvation just increases all the more when someone believes on Jesus and is saved. Conversion is an instantaneous experience. It happens in, in a moment. And, and it includes sanctification by the Spirit, or, or to put it a more biblically correct way, the process of sanctification by the Spirit includes conversion. Did you catch what I just said there? So the, the Spirit of God has already been cleansing someone, already been sanctifying, and then they're saved, and then this process takes on this whole new power because they've been washed in the blood, and now they are walking with the Lord. So the, the Spirit's ministering to someone long before they're saved, and of course, continues to after. So um, this goes into the Spirit's next role, which is realizing righteousness in the believer. So the Spirit of God, um, just like that transition from conviction to conversion, as the believer has increased you know, submission and surrender and, and cooperation, this intimacy with the Spirit, the, the result is that the Spirit has access to someone's life to do an even greater work. And so this is becoming like Jesus, realizing righteousness in your life, how you deal with others and, and how you go about your life becoming like Jesus, deliverance from sin, addiction, you know, chains that have, have bound a person. And finally, 
um, the role of the Holy Spirit empowering the believer. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit opens up a, a, a new role for the believer in the, in the sanctifying process of the world. Empowered by the Spirit, we can expect God to confirm his word with signs and with wonders through our life. This is Romans 15, verse 18. So the Spirit continues speaking to believers to send forth specific people into ministries just like the Holy Spirit was doing in the book of Acts, uh, sometimes even into specific places. And in this way, the Spirit-filled believer assists the Spirit in the task of sanctifying the world. This is the high call of God. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in, in the earth. Spiritual gifts are available to those that are baptized in the Spirit. Um, this, this will come along and, and aid the saints, um, help the church. This, this may include something like a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, prophecy, a tongue, interpretation, gifts of healing. And the Bible says all of these are for the common good, for the strengthening, the building up of the church. The Spirit also builds up the saints for effective ministry in another way, through his ministry of intercession. Paul says this, in the same way the Spirit helps in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. It's awesome. The Spirit prays through us and for the church through us. All right, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. William Barclay uh, wrote this. The story of the Bible is the story of spirit-filled men. I love that definition. And let's include women. The story of the Bible is a story of spirit-filled men and women. Right now, there is revival going on in the earth as we record this session, and it's increasing. And it's not necessarily in denominations or traditional streams, and it's certainly not in cessationist churches, but it's in and through churches that have embraced the power and the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I've had the privilege of sitting with people that have been part of churches, sometimes underground churches in in. in countries and regions of the world where that is necessary, and they've told me that, that people are being converted and saved every day, and, and it's not because of programs, it's not because of really nice lights in churches, but it's because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that people are getting up out of wheelchairs, and people are hearing their names called, you know, people are, are prophesying, this is who you are, and this is your kid's name, and this is what God's going to, it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. More than half a billion believers, it's, it's beyond that now, more than half a billion believers globally now call themselves Pentecostal or charismatic Christians. When before 1900, no one had really ever even heard of that description. Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is there's been insane exponential growth of spirit-empowered churches all over the world in the last hundred years or so. And this book of Acts breed of believers views Pentecost not only as a key redemptive event recorded in Scripture, but also as an experience of empowerment available to every modern day believer. Here's what a, a theologian, Larry Hart, said about the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Traditionally, spirit baptism has been understood as the an, uh, uh, in the initi initiatory sense of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Every true believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit at the new birth and in dwelling of the spirit. It is what constitutes one as a Christian. Pentecostals, keying primarily on Luke's theology, have understood spirit baptiz baptism in the empowering sense. See Acts 2, 8, 9, 10, 19, as establishing another blessing in empowerment subsequent to conversion and signified by speaking in other tongues. I know that's a, a long definition, but a helpful one. On the day of Pentecost, Peter issued the gospel invitation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, 
and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Now, why is this an important verse? Of course, for many reasons, but I want to key in on the call. The call is to all, to you, to you to your children, and to all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God will call. So real quick now, there are actually three baptisms, uh, scripturally speaking, uh, which in the Greek is baptisto, uh, which means to fully, entirely, completely immerse, to be immersed. So if you're going to immerse something, uh, it's going to be completely wet. It's not a splash. It's not a little sprinkle happened to come as you were walking past. It, it, it's to be completely drenched, it's, it's to be soaking wet, it's to be immersed. That's the, that's the Greek, um, baptizo. So, so what we would say is that at salvation, the Holy Spirit is in you. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, as another experience, now you are in the Holy Spirit. That, that's the most biblically accurate way I can describe that. So at salvation, the Holy Spirit's in you. When you're baptized, now you're in the Holy Spirit. So three baptisms for every believer, and you need all three. You should want all three. Uh, What are the three baptisms? Uh, One, the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes us in Jesus. This is what we've been talking about, that sanctifying, drawing work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. This is the body of Christ. This is into Jesus. The next, the disciple comes along and baptizes us in water. It's Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we immerse people in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a symbol. This is a sign. This is a public announcement that you've been saved. And then, so there's salvation, there's water, and then there's spirit. Spirit baptism. Acts 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So so pay attention there to what Jesus called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls it the promise. The promise, right? Wait for the promise. Now, Acts 2 and 37. Watch for the three baptisms. This is just cool. This is Bible nerd cool stuff, all right? The three baptisms all there. Acts 2 and verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise. There's that same word. The promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. So repent, salvation. Let every one of you be baptized. There's water. Let's go find some water somewhere. And then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's the spirit baptism. Now, let me clarify for somebody. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. People have said, oh, 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 the the gift of the Holy Spirit is tongues. No, that's one gift. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And when you get the gift of the Holy Spirit, you get all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So, so go back to Acts 2 real quick. Check out verse 39 now. Next verse. Remember Jesus said, wait until you receive the promise. Now here's why that matters. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you because people have said, okay, well, that's cool to read about it, but, but that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that was just for the 120, just for people back when the Bible was being written. There, there's, there's lots of thought, lots of argument for, for all of that. Look at the next verse, verse 39. Acts 2.39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. Maybe you've heard people say this all your life. Maybe you've already experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you didn't think that that was for you. I hope that I'm showing you here in the Bible that God wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Three baptisms, salvation, water, and the Spirit. You need all three. You should want all three. So here's an important question. Who's baptized in the Holy Spirit? I've got a simple answer. The people that ask. That's what Jesus said. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Ask, Jesus said, and then got very specific, and I will give you the Holy Spirit. 
So, next question, what happens when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit? On the day of Pentecost, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in other tongues. That was the immediate evidence. But it's including, in many scriptural references, a life empowered to live victoriously over sin. Empowered to be a witness to Christ. Empowered to share the good news. Empowered to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 empowered to walk in much greater intimacy with Jesus, empowered to hear and know God's voice on a regular basis. I can, I can give you my story. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, everything changed. I, I, I found myself drawing close to the Lord and knowing the Lord like never before and, and empowered for ministry. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Look, anybody that's ever gotten drunk, you know, pre-Jesus, any, anybody that's ever gotten drunk knows you don't stay drunk forever. You got to drink again. And, and if you eat, for another example, you don't stay full forever. You got to eat again. And maybe you're like, well, I, th- I appreciate this session and, and this is great. Man, I was baptized in the spirit that one time uh, 17 years ago at at youth camp when somebody laid hands on me and I spoke in tongues and I was baptized in the spirit. I love that. That's great. But the same disciples who were filled in Acts 2, in Acts 4, just a few chapters later, came up under persecution and they prayed. And the Bible says, again, those same people were filled with the Holy Spirit. A few more chapters later, same people, same experience. They were filled again with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptism is not a one-time experience. It's an ongoing experience. In fact, one place in Scripture, the the Greek actually best translates to be being filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. So you can experience another infilling today and tomorrow and the next day. And Jesus said, just ask and I'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. So here's a question that the church has asked and, and debated over and wrote books on what is the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, or how do you know? So most people center this conversation around tongues because it's, it's a very biblical you know, um, focus. So with regard to tongues being the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we could sum it all up in kind of three basic views. Number one would say speaking in tongues is not the evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, And I'll explain that a little bit more. Number two, baptism in the Holy Spirit sometimes is evidenced by speaking in tongues. And then number three, baptism in the Holy Spirit is always accompanied by the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. So to back up, speaking in tongues as not the evidence would mean someone basically believes one is saved and baptized in the Spirit at the same time, and there's no additional experience in terms of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This, of course, is a tough one to hold on to because Acts is literally full of instances where people that are already saved, they're saved people, and then they become Holy Spirit-filled people. So I just can't get down with that viewpoint at all. Moving on from there, number two, baptism in the Holy Spirit is sometimes accompanied by speaking in tongues. This is a position that, that lots of the charismatic church has taken, um, you know, um, This view would say that speaking in tongues is an evidence, but not the evidence. And then finally, the third view is that it is the evidence, or it's the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So let's break it down biblically. In three cases where Luke, who is the author of Acts, in three cases where Luke records details of individuals experiencing being baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues is clearly evident. It's right there. On the day of Pentecost... All 120 people of the Bible, they they all spoke in tongues, languages that they did not know. Um, Here's what Ralph uh, Riggs, a theologian Ralph Riggs said. This speaking in other tongues then became the sign and the evidence that the Holy Spirit had descended upon the New Testament Christians. The next clear case of speaking in tongues is in Acts, uh, in Acts, is the incident of of Cornelius in Acts 10, 44. Um, Pentecostal scholars would would also say that Luke in Acts revealed a pattern in these three cases. A distinctive experience of the spirit, you know, of the evidence being people speaking in tongues. So Pentecostals would say uh, the Samaritan believers, Acts 8, 4, for example, spoke in tongues 
like the 120 on the day of Pentecost and like the household of Cornelius and like the Ephesian disciples, uh, but it just wasn't explicitly recorded by Luke. It, it was like Luke established a pattern like, hey, when people get filled with the Holy Spirit, they speak in tongues. And then there was just several other instances where Luke just didn't really, you know, necessarily need to include it. That, that would be the position of Pentecostal Bible scholars. So here's, here's what F.F. F. Bruce said along these same lines. Um, about the Samaritan believers being filled. The context leaves us in no doubt that their reception of the Spirit was attended by external manifestations such as had marked his ascent on the earliest disciples at Pentecost. So what they're basically saying is it's not there, but it is there. Because everybody was like, they've been filled with the Spirit. How did they know? These people were speaking in tongues. That's how they knew. Um, So finally... Uh, moving on, what is the purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Here's, here's what Gordon Fee one time said. There is a deep dissatisfaction with life in Christ without life in the Spirit. And this is the background for the exploding Pentecostal movement that's happening around the world. What does this mean? Believers are meant to live a Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered, Holy Spirit-baptized life. Without the role of the Holy Spirit, we end up in legalism, we end up striving, we, we end up chained in our sin, we, we end up in dead religion, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we've got joy and peace, uh, unspeakable, we've got peace, we've got power for the mission. One final quote as we close this session on pneumatology, final quote from Stanley Horton, Luke's theology is clear. If the gift of the Spirit was charismatic or vocational for Jesus and the early church, so it ought to have a vocational dimension in the experience of God's people today. Why? Because the church today, like the church in the book of Acts, needs the dynamic power of the Spirit to enable it to evangelize the world effectively and build the body of Christ. I pray that you got something today in this session, and I pray that you would experience a daily infilling and baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I want to pray with you real quick before we close this session. Lord, I thank you for the one on the other side of that lens, and I thank you that you've got a great plan and a great purpose for them. God, maybe they've experienced the touch of your Holy Spirit in the past. Maybe they haven't. But I pray right now when I come into agreement with them, God, along your promises, Jesus, you said, all, anybody and everybody that asks, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, we ask together, would you give us the Holy Spirit? Would you fill us with the Holy Spirit, empower us with the Holy Spirit? We thank you that you would breathe on us now again, Jesus. We thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us for this session of Cause Seminary. Uh, feel free to browse around and check out the other sessions. We'll see you next time.